welcome students and humans of all descriptions. Uh, before we start class, I have a, a little bit of uh, news for you. Uh, I, I, hurt, I hurt my knee yesterday somehow. I don't know how I did it, but I'm kind of hobbling around. So if you see me kind of limping around like somebody in pain, that I am in pain, and I'm trying to minimize the amount of walking around I have to do. Uh, so just so you know, I, hopefully it'll be better by next week. It's, it's already better. So I twisted it yesterday, and I have no idea what I did. Uh, but uh, in case you're wondering, uh, that's what it is. Uh, let's go ahead and start with our, our lecture for today. We're going to be talking about Newton's second law uh, in two dimensions, mostly a bunch of practice, and then we'll start talking about how to apply Newton's second law to the case of some skateboarders. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if you brought a skateboard to class. Have you got? All right, great. I want if if we don't get to you uh, skateboarders today, then I want you to try to bring them on Monday, and that'll uh, help us out. Uh, before we get to talking about Newton's second law, and uh, we'll do a talking PDF on the document cam in just a few minutes. Uh, before we get to all that, I want to go over a few things, this and that, uh, concerning uh, exams and stuff. First of all, there's a special SI review session that Maria has set up, uh, and I've put a little yellow blob at the top of our homepage in web courses. That's where the black arrow is pointing. Uh, the basic specs are that it's going to be next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, over in classroom building one. So this is classroom building two, and classroom building one is right across the courtyard from us, and room 107, which I believe that, huh? Six? Oh, gosh. But you told me, is it four to six, or is it at six? Gosh. All right, I'm going to pause the podcast for a second. 6 p.m., classroom building one, room 107. And how long does it go? So 6 to 7? 6 to 7.30, okay. Uh, and what Maria is going to do there is give you uh, a chance to uh, review and get ready for uh, exam two, or excuse me, exam one, which is a week from today. A week from today, you'll be taking your first exam. And I know a lot of you may be feeling a bit uh, nervous um, about the exam, and it's normal. Don't, don't feel like you're not normal or anything, because, you know, my... You know, even if you have friends that have taken my class, you're still going to be nervous, a lot of you, um, until the first exam. Then you'll see everything works. Anyway, so Maria's uh, special SI review next uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Uh, office hours for me, as always, Wednesdays, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we had a bunch of guys in there yesterday, and we were brainstorming away and taking notes and talking it over. And, hey, you guys, you know, it, if I could give you one study tip to get ready, especially to get ready for exams, it would be to find at least one human study partner. And I'm not – because the process of talking it over – with another human is infinitely superior, well, not infinitely, but much superior to just studying over and reading the book. And if you, if you are making, if you're missing something and nobody's there to talk it over with to maybe point something out to you, you're, gonna, you're never going to catch it. But if you have a study partner or more than one study partner, yeah, that's going to really help you. 
Because it forces you to think. You know, you're studying with a partner, and you're talking things over, and hopefully you are the kind of person that uh, thinks before you speak most of the time. And if you are, you'll be doing exactly what I want you to do, and that is to think. So that's my little study tip. A um, couple uh, little blurbs about iClicker registration. There's still a sizable fraction of class. You are not registered. And I want to emphasize that you must do it through the web courses uh, tool for iClicker registration. And the black arrow down here in the lower right shows you uh, where, where that is. Okay? And it is mandatory. And the reason it's mandatory is because um, it's 10% of your semester grade. And if you don't register it, you're not going to get those points. Not uh, not a single one. And so uh, technically, uh, without that 10%, uh, you can't get, well, you, you can get an A if you, um, if you don't do any clicking, but you have to ace everything. Homework, exams, final. Uh, so, you know, having some of those clicking participation points is nice. Um, now, I put a little uh, extra line in your grades page so that you can know if you're registered or not. Now, some of you already know for sure, and I've talked to you, and you've noticed um, the bonus points and stuff. But if you look on the home page, um, over here is a little blue circle with a number in it to signify that there's, in this case, uh, one new uh, piece of data in the grades page. And in this particular case, it's this line here. iClicker is registered, question mark. And then one signifies yes, zero signifies no. So I've set that up for everybody. And this particular student has got a zero, so that means that he is not registered. And you want to have a one there. If you don't already, uh, if you have a zero there, you're in big trouble until you get it. All right, so you want to try to either contact me or use the registra registration tool. And there's a big discussion uh, thread uh, going about how to you know, register and stuff. Now, I want to point something out to you. And if you have a zero in the is iClicker registered question mark column of the gradebook, you want to pay special attention. Many of you think that if you have the Go Nitro message and the check marks and everything ready, uh, that you are squared away. You are not squared away, not necessarily. Because iClicker is set up for anonymous polling. And that means they hand it out to a big crowd of people, and they don't really care the names of the people, just the fact that they're clicking on uh, a bunch of questions and stuff. And there's a legitimate use for that. You know, like if I go to a workshop for how to teach scientific topics and concepts and stuff, they might hand out a bunch of clickers. Matter of fact, I was at a meeting here uh, a few weeks ago uh, over in the School of Ed. And they had clickers, and it was anonymous clicking. They didn't really care about me as an individual. Uh, they just want to see what the group as a whole was doing, and they don't need names for that. But you need names, because this is what it looks like. This is my grade book. And right here, look at that. That number in red, that's a serial number. 979F9E96. That student's clicking, but I have no idea who it is. And all the other red numbers you see, and there's a whole bunch below that. It's just a little screen grab. And that is a problem. Because if I don't know your name, I don't know to give you any points for class participation. So anonymous polling does not cut it. Your grade is going to be toast. And you don't want that. 
you want to crush everything in your path. Okay, so you want to make sure that you get uh, squared away with uh, the registration. ASAP. Any additional questions, my wonderful students, about exams, about clicking? Yes. The question was, how similar are the homework questions to the exam questions? I cannot answer that. Because, and I know, thank you, I know you're trying to get me to answer, what, tell you what's going to be on the test. But I will say this, that if you work diligently and faithfully on the homework and use those to study with, you'll have a certain degree of happiness after the, after the exam. Uh, so it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be like, you know, night and day. Or so it's not going to be a drastic, but, but no, I'm not going to tell you what's going to be on the exam. Nice try. Any other questions? Freshman, newbie freshman. You don't want to say, but I know, there, I know you're out there. I know there's a lot of you that are newbies. I see one guy over here smiling. Yeah, that's me. I'm a newbie. <laughs> uh, and he sees shaking his head over there. No, I'm not really. That's all right. Anyways, newbie freshman, you know what they typically ask me? Hey, Dr. B, are we going to have a study guide for the test? And you know what they mean? They mean, what are the questions on the test? Because apparently here in Florida, the practice is that in high school, the teacher gives the students a bunch of a study guide for the test, which includes a bunch of stuff that either they memorize or the exact questions. I've seen it. My son is in high school. I've seen it. Uh, but I never do that. So there's no study guide. Your lecture, not for me, your lecture notes are your study guide. All right? So think of it that way. And just to let you know, the priority that you should have is lecture. Lecture notes. If it's in lecture notes, it's possibly going to be on the exam. Secondary importance, clicker questions, and homework questions, okay? That's, you know, those are meant to support the things that I talk about in lecture, and the things I talk about in lecture are the things that I think are important. And therefore, on exam, when I try to see if you understand the things that I think are important, if you focused on the things that I think are important, i.e. your lecture notes and the supporting clicker and homework questions, you're going to be copacetic. You're going to be looking good. Hopefully. Question. Go ahead. You, you went like this. Go ahead. The book has content in it? Readings? So, so what is your question? Go ahead. I'll, I'll. Okay, because like you know, like just should we know like all the reading material too and everything to help the kids? Okay, the reading the textbook. How does that relate to? Okay, the textbook was written by me for this class, and it is meant to support the lectures. Okay, so you should be reading the entire chapter. But let your, let your brain, you know, let your mind focus on especially the things in the readings that you've also kind of heard me talk about in the lecture. All right? Uh, yeah? I haven't had an You can see them all. Yeah, everything. Everything that you see on the screen up here, you can see in YouTube. And there's a link to the YouTube uh, playlist. Uh, and it's, it's, I have separate YouTubes for the morning and the noon lecture. So everything's copacetic, works good. Matter of fact, that brings me to a topic that I saw uh, this morning, in dis actually yesterday, in discussions. And I want you all to make a, a note of this. Um, Ashley Seifert typed in this question. 
Uh, I am wanting to begin studying for the first midterm. What types of questions can we expect? Will we mostly be solving equations? I think I've answered that. And I, in this discussion thread, I asked um, Darianne and Caroline to um, type in some answers and some tips. Caroline, go ahead. Can you stand up for a second? This is Caroline, our, TA, our mighty TA. And she's... Here's, here's, her, here's her first comment right here. She typed in a reply to Ashley Seifert's, and Darian's got one in there too. Uh, so go ahead and read and, and respond to those and just kind of coordinate maybe a little bit with Darian or, or Caroline. Uh, and just, as I said, finding at least one study partner um, is very, very productive uh, for learning. Uh, so try to try to remember that. And let's just go ahead and, and put the word yay next to Caroline's. My, this is just the first line of it. She has a, a nice little paragraph in there. Okay, uh, last time we were talking about Newton's first and second laws of motion. And I want to continue that. We're going to do some clicking. Uh, so get your clickers out. And if you are... Clicking for the first time with your eye clicker, and I know a few of you are, uh, the way that you get uh, locked onto our frequency is you hold the power button down for like a second or two, and then as soon as the big square starts flashing in the upper right of the display, type in the letter A and then the letter A again, and that'll lock you into the AA frequency, and then you'll get the Go Nitro message and then the ready message. And that means you're good. And when you are, you can start using the clicking device to think your way through this question. Question number one. Which velocity graph, or graphs plural, represent an object speeding up from rest. And for those of you that are in the back, you might not be able to see the red color very well. Uh, it's the bold, thick line. Twenty seconds to vote. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Now I just gave you one minute and seven seconds to answer that, and that's roughly what you've got to do on the exam. I budget the time one minute per question, and so there's going to be about 50 questions, 50 points, and so uh, that's pretty good for a one-hour test. It usually works out pretty good, and we actually have a little bit more than that. Whoa! Looks like everybody voted for option D here. But you know, the thing about it is, option D is correct, so you're, you're looking good. Yeah, that's the one that's starting up from rest. Now. Next question. We're just building up. I'm going to be burning your brains in a second. You, you, you crushed that one, but let's see if you can crush this one. In 60 seconds. Gone in 60 seconds. How would you describe the motion? Described or displayed in graph three. And I highlighted graph three. That's just one in the, the lower right of the four graphs. Ten seconds to vote. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys have got here. 
stop. Hmm. I see that there's a lot of people that voted for option B. Uh, and actually, that is correct. And well, make a note of that. A lot of times, my just so you know, my clicker questions actually lead to a discussion that you can put in your notes. So make a note of uh, the questions if you can as, you, as we go. Another question. The blue car. Now this is all verbal. There's no diagrams or sketches for this. What's the meaning of this sentence? And see how quiet the room is? I got you right where I want you. You're reading carefully and thinking. Dr. B strikes again. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys. Man. You guys are hard to burn. I don't know. This is, you guys are crushing this. Um, now, I, I noticed that nobody voted for F. You can't actually vote for F. And, but you know what? I, I wrote a, I, when I was in grad school, I wrote an astronomy test where the last option was none of the no well the last option was all of the above and the option above that was none of the above so if you voted for all of the above it included none of the above so so just the, my lesson to you is read carefully now i want you to make a couple notes on this okay if i say that something's moving to the right at constant speed go ahead and put a dot down here to represent the center of mass of this uh, little blue car. All right, and so it, it, what you could do is write um, a rightward pointing arrow like this. Just make it kind of medium size. And then you could write down a little sentence like this in vector format. Vector VI, initial velocity, is uh, 10.5 meters per second, comma rightward. And remember, when you um, specify or write down a velocity, you have to some way communicate two things. The speed, which in this case is 10.5 meters per second from the speedometer, and the direction. Like, so you, you would use the word rightward or northeast or whatever the direction is. Right? And so in this example, you could definitely write this one down. All right? And uh, so now I have another question about the blue car. Are you ready? Because I mean, heretofore you've been crushing things, but can you crush this one? It's a little more deluxe thinking. So I want you to read carefully. Read carefully, especially on exams. And Caroline, on the Twitter feed, I want you to make a note about when, when we close this question, I want you to make a note about the responses and describe this question as um, statement or set of statements about motion or about forces and then describe the responses. All right, I'll give you and so so read carefully and make a decision. And as I've mentioned before, when you're in class, if you want to coordinate and discuss things with your neighbor, go to it. We definitely
You know, so if your neighbor says, um, why are you answering that? Then you can tell them. Or if they say, how... Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's see what you guys got. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Very mysterious. Look at that. Big range of answers. All right. And let me see. Uh, a big fraction of you voted for B. And the rest of you voted around the around the other options but guess what um b is not correct all right so let's talk when i see a spread you guys when i see a spread of data like this a spread of answers that means and especially if the correct answer is not selected the biggest pile is not selected for the correct answer that means we've got to talk it over, which is all right. It's normal, right? Talk it over now, and then if I, answer, if I ask you a question like this on the exam, you'll crush it, right? So let's talk it over. First of all, this one here, no force is acting on this car. That is actually acceptable. Remember, Newton's first law, if there are no unbalanced forces or no forces at all, then it's just going to cook along at a constant velocity. This one is wrong. B is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So option B, two and three, boop, incorrect. Also, option E, boop, incorrect. Because that includes all of them. Now, option two, why is that incorrect? Incorrect. Why is option two not correct? This is constant speed. It's constant speed, so therefore what? Therefore, there is no unbalanced force. Okay, if, there's, if it's constant speed, there's no unbalanced force. Everything balances. Okay? It, what, and let, let me put it, let me turn it around. So Nick gave that answer. Let me turn it around. What does happen if there's an unbalanced force? acceleration and that's not what we've got here all right so option two and hey you guys test taking strategy wise option two if you nail that one or I, I should say if you cross that one out that bugs out option B and option E so you've eliminated if, if that's all you can remember and you answer one of the other three you got a good shot now let's look at the other Options here. Option three, yeah, that's good. Multiple balancing, multiple forces, but the net force is zero. Yeah, that means they all add up to zero. You have the same amount of uh, rightward force as you have right uh, leftward force, just opposite directions. You have the same amount of upward force as you have downward force, right? whatever it happens to be. And for that reason, option four is also kosher. Make a side note, Ellen. And everybody, make a side note that options three and four are equivalent. Option four is just a little bit more detail. But those two are equivalent. And secondary note, option one is different. It's true, but it's not the same as three and four. 
So the correct answer here is option D. And let's see, I, I hear somebody over here going, yes. Uh, option D, whoa. Seven percent of the class got that right. Ooh, Dr. B, a brain burner. So what we've just done is a set of questions from pretty basic, where you all nail it, to pretty tough. All right, so that gives you an idea. And these are multiple choice questions. We'll be doing some calculations in a minute. But this is, these are multiple choice questions. And I can basically write a multiple choice test if I want that can make a grad student cry and call for their mama. You know, I've, so, it, you know, it just depends. You, it just depends on how I write it. And this is an example. All right, let's keep going. Now, I want to talk about, oh, sorry. There's a question in the back over here. In the middle. Yeah, go ahead. They're not all right. The, the one that's right is uh, option D. That's one, three, and four. Yeah, and that's why I underlined the word could. And I didn't use the word, which is the only one. Okay, and I couldn't use which is the only one. Because if you don't know anything about the forces, you don't know, you can't, if all you know, Nick, is that you've got constant velocity, you can't tell w whether it's one, three, or four. Okay? Is that, is that a satisfactory answer? So, yeah, I mean, it's... And that's why I say read carefully. All right? Because a lot of this stuff, there are fine points that I'm going to try to draw out of your mind if it's there by questions that are, you know, difficult like this. Question over here. I guess I had assumed that it was gravity or something that was going to make this part of that to assume. Should I not assume anything but proportional? Just assume what you've got. If, and that's kind of, uh, what, what's your, young lady? What's your name? You're for, yeah, the, you that asked the question with the specs. Jesse. Jesse's question was basically kind of the same as you. And the, the answer to your question is, don't assume anything, but answer what you can. So one, three, and four are possible. They could be fair. But until we know more, we can't really specify to, you know, the, the full answer or the precise answer to Jesse's question. Now, if we did know that there were forces acting, then it either... Three or four would be would be fine, but it's possible. So Jesse, if you go like out into outer space, way past any galaxy, you know, far away from any galaxy or anything, so no gravity or anything like that, um, no forces, you know, you know, you just cook along at, you know, ten point five meters per second or whatever the speed is, all right, and that would be no forces. That would be option one. So option one is kind of hypothetical. Option three and option four are definitely the, the usual case. I mean, if you're in a, think of it, uh, Jesse, and what's your name? Sean. Sean and Jesse and everyone, raise your hand if you've ever been in a jet flying to Atlanta or New York or something. Okay. Nobody else has been in a jet? Yeah, an airplane. And it, not, a, not a fighter jet. Not an A-10 Warthog. I mean, you know, like on American or JetBlue or something like that. Raise your hand. Okay, so that's a bunch of you. All right, now, if you're, if you're on American and you have a personal emergency and you have to go to those little lavatories in the back of the plane, you get up and you walk, right? And it's like you're not, it, Jesse, it's like you're right here in this classroom. You just walk, you know. And if there's no turbulence, you just walk. It's, and that's because you're in a state of constant velocity. Okay? And if you encounter turbulence, that's not, you get buffeted left and right and up and down and stuff. Raise your hand if you've ever been in bad turbulence. 
Ooh, I've never been. I've been in a little bit of turbulence, but never bad turbulence. I've been in bad airports, but never bad turbulence. Anyway, so the, the whole idea of, like, if you've ever been in an airplane and you walk up and down the aisles for whatever reason, uh, it's constant velocity, 600 miles an hour, with so many feet altitude, certain direction. But there's plenty of forces. I mean, the jets are blazing, right? And the, the wings are providing lift. Gravity's providing downward force. There's all kinds of air resistance. So yeah, there's force, and that's that would be a three or a four, Roman numeral three or a Roman numeral four. Right. So let's um, go through. And now I'm actually we're going to talk about this ballistic arc. In other words the direction and path of a Ferrari driving off a cliff. So that's a two-dimensional problem for which we can apply the results of Newton's second law. Um, but before we do that one, I want to review, and this is kind of going towards Sean's and Jesse's and a few of your other questions. Let's go one second before they launch over the edge. When they launch over the edge, they're going to have unbalanced forces. But... If they're still up there, they're heading towards the edge. It's a, let's say that it's a nice, smooth, level plateau. And they're just cruising along at 10.5 meters per second. So 10.5 meters per second, that's 20-something mm, miles an hour, maybe. 23, 24 miles an hour. So it's a normal speed. But at T minus 1.00 second before they drive off the cliff, if that's a, a perfectly flat horizontal cliff, neither uphill nor downhill, neither tilted uphill or downhill, um, then there's going to be a bunch of forces acting on it. And this is a case of Roman numeral 3 or Roman numeral 4. Right, so go ahead and write a little dot down here where you have a little bit of room in your notes somewhere. And that's going to represent for us the center of mass of this car at time t equals one point, negative 1.00 1 seconds. Okay, and let's just make a list of the forces. And this is going to be fairly realistic. These are, this list is what you would call the constituent forces acting on this car for which the net force is zero. All right, weight force, downward. So go ahead and draw a downward arrow. And I've labeled it vector W, capital W, for the weight force. Now, up on top of the cliff, you're, you're on top of a a granite cliff or a sandstone cliff or something, and those are minerals made up of molecules, and they have some rigidity, and the rigidity of the cliff is what supports against gravity. So we'll call that vector N, capital N, and it is known informally as the normal force. And that's because in math classes, the idea, the, the word normal means, I don't know how they invented it, but they use the word normal to mean perpendicular to a surface. I don't know why they don't call it perpendicular, they call it normal. Math department's a little squirrely, so I guess maybe that explains it. Anyways, normal force, capital N, and that's from the rigidity force of the cliff top. And you can think about it as just like the rigidity force of a tabletop. The tabletop's made of steel and a little bit of hydrocarbon, plastic, maybe some wood. And those molecules um, in the surface submicroscopically form a little bit of a net. Now, if you've ever been on a trampoline, you know that if you stand in the middle of the trampoline, the trampoline goes down, you know, like, so it might go down. If you get on there, it might go down three inches. But then if a little shrimpy kid gets on there, a little shrimpy first grader, it might, just, it might go down just by one inch. Okay? But no matter who, now you can't put a, a, an elephant on a trampoline. It'll, it'll break it. All right? And the same thing with these. If we put an elephant on top of one of these tables, it would bust it. But short of that, a tabletop, the rigidity force, will stabilize 
almost anything that's on top of it. Just like a trampoline will hold either a, a little shrimpy first grader or a flea or a regular adult sized human, right? But not much bigger than that. Maybe three or four adult sized humans, I guess, but not much bigger than that. So that's the normal force. And so the normal force is like a trampoline force, except it's submicroscopic. It is an intermolecular network that produces an intermolecular force like a trampoline. Horizontal applied force. Yeah, you got if you're if you're in that car, you're heading for the edge of the cliff, you gotta have the gas pedal down, at least a little bit. Now 20 uh, 20 something miles per hour, 10.5 meters per second, that's kind of pokey. You're not really hitting the gas real hard. Except I bet there's somebody in this class who's 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 uh, got a car that's kind of a beater and might not go much more than 10.5 even with the with the pedal to the metal. But hopefully that's nobody in here. But you gotta hit the gas. And then of course uh, we'll give that a, a right word and we'll call it capital F for the applied force. And then there's going to be some friction that opposes the motion. Now if it were sliding, it would be uh, a lot of force, but even something that's rolling has some frictional force. So let's give that a little arrow. And if you notice here, my assumption is that the left and the rightward pointing arrows uh, are the same size, but they're different directions, they're opposite directions. The normal force and the weight force, since everything is balanced, and Sean, since we have constant velocity, by assumption, we're, we're assuming this guy on top of the cliff, before he hits the edge of the cliff, he's on cruise control at 10.5 meters per second. So make a note up here. I should have put it in the slide. I didn't think of it until now. Uh, right here, cruise control. Over here, once he clears the cliff, unbalanced force. So cruise control over here, constant velocity, force is balanced. And that's what we've got down here. So your two leftward arrows are the same size. And I made mine smaller because the frictional force is usually going to be uh, much smaller than the weight force. The normal force upward from the rigidity of the cliff, it, the cliff top, is going to be the same size as the weight force. So the vertical up and the vertical down uh, are the same size arrows. All right, so try to make your arrows look uh, symmetric left and right, symmetric up and down. Now, one other thing that we can say about this is that in this particular case, we are operating in Roman numeral three or Roman numeral four uh, of that previous uh, clicker question, right? Because we have forces and they balance. Roman numeral one is not in action here. All right, let's get to the actual ballistic arc itself. So the Ferrari launches off at time t equals zero, it crosses the edge of the cliff, and it arcs down on a parabola. And what we're going to do is a document cam where we work out the parabola formula, uh, just the way uh, Galileo might have done it. Uh, and so let's get down some of the concepts first. First of all, the forces. You know, Newton's law says if there's an unbalanced force, yup, you're going to get some acceleration. If there's no unbalanced force, nope, no acceleration. Now, gravity is vertical. And so in the vertical dimension, in the y-coordinate, uh, you have to use f equals ma. Also, we're going to use a negative sign on the gravitational acceleration. So g equals negative 9.8 meters per second squared, or meters per second per second, either way you want to write it. All right, and that's because we want to keep accurate track of where we are in relation to the top of the cliff. All right. Also, the vertical y-coordinate is going to use uh, distance 
triangle technology. So we're going to have a 1 half gt squared somewhere in there. You know, when we get an equation for the y coordinate, yep, there's going to be a 1 half gt squared, and the g value is going to be negative. Now, horizontally, there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. Even Bugs Bunny knows that. And he's a rabbit. He's a, tr a tricky, tricky rabbit. All right? And because there's no horizontal gravity, the initial component of the velocity horizontally doesn't change. There's no acceleration in the x direction. So if, if you launch at 10.5 meters per second, um, you're still going to be moving sideways at 10.5 meters per second when you impact. And then, of course, you'll stop, you know. And hopefully you bail out of the uh, Ferrari before it impacts. But the horizontal acceleration is zero. So the x coordinate is going to use distance rectangle technology. So we're going to have v times delta t, or v times t, in the x-coordinate. Now, one of the things that I want to do with you is set up a coordinate axis uh, at the clifftop. So my choice, and this will simplify the equations quite a bit, if we put the x-axis parallel to the clifftop, and the y-axis vertical to that, or perpendicular to that, so that right at the edge of the cliff top is the um, origin of the coordinates, 0, 0, in the xy system. In this xy system, um, things will be pretty easy. You know, we could set up the xy coordinates down here at the base of the cliff if we wanted to, you know, right below that, but this is the easy set up. All right. The initial conditions can now be written down, the initial position and the initial velocity. So let's look at this. Initial velocity, v subscript x. That means the x component of the velocity. How much sideways meters per second do you have? And we're still using 10.5 meters per second. All right, just for a round number, nothing too special. It's a, it's, a, it's a realistic number for a car. And uh, the y component, v subscript y, that's 0 0.00 because the cliff top is horizontal. It's flat. It's neither tilting upward or tilting downward. All right. Now, if you were on top of the cliff, and you took a baseball and hove the baseball up into the sky and then it would start falling, you know? If you're trying to get maximum distance, yeah, then VY, you'd have to give it some positive VY if you're throwing it upwards. If you were trying to, you know, uh, throw a water balloon at somebody down below the cliff, you know, you're standing there at the edge of the cliff, you might want to throw it downward, okay? And then that would change the VY into a negative number. But if you're just driving flat, flat off the top of the cliff, VY is 0. Now, initial position, X and Y, 0, comma, 0. 0. 0.00 meters for X, 0. 0.00 meters for Y. Ooh, I wrote them in opposite order. Well, that's all right. Y and X, X and Y. Now, a consequence or a logical denotation of these data and this coordinate system is, and I'll let you think about it, over here in the lower right where the Ferrari impacts, that's going to be a negative value for y. All right? And that is why I insist on up here in number 1a, using g equal to a negative 9.8 meters per second per second. All right? That is the negative sign that gives us a negative value down here at impact for the y-coordinate. All right? 
Now, I want to uh, go to the document camera, and this is a, actually an image from page 28. We're kind of in page 28 of the textbook, and we're working at this parabola stuff, similar to what Galileo did. And I'm going to pause the podcast for just a minute. Okay, so we just went over that, and just to remind you, that's uh, there's a discussion kind of parallel to that around page 28 of the e-text. All right, some more details about Newton's second law. These are the three equations that we've got so far concerning acceleration. The top equation up here in the upper right is basically the definition of acceleration. And then the middle equation and the bottom equation, the third equation, uh, are Newton's second law. A equals F net over M, and then F equals MA. Both those different versions of the same law. Now, if you take the third version, Danya, and you replace the A here for acceleration with delta V over delta T. You can do that. It's, it's normal. You get an equation that looks like this. Now, this is really nice to me because it can be really instructive to think about forces. If it, And I'll, I'll just uh, give you the example of uh, doing a plyometric workout at the gym, box jumping. You know, one of the plyometric methods is, you know, jump from the floor up on top of the box, jump from the box down to the floor, and it, it, supposedly it develops your fast twitch fibers and stuff like that. And one of the things about that, the, the stopping force comes from the floor when you land on the floor. If you, land, if you jump up on top of the box, the stopping force comes from the box. It has to be a fairly rigid box. The bo and the floor has to be fairly rigid. You can't do box jumping with boxes made of jello. Everybody knows that. All right? It's got to be rigid. So the stopping for so make a note of it. Box jumping, plyometric, stopping force is the rigidity force from the floor or from the box. Delta T would be the stopping time. If you drop from the, the box to the floor, you're going to dissipate a certain amount of downward speed by the stopping force. You're going to dissipate that speed by bending your knees. And it's going to take a certain amount of time. And that's the stopping time. So now a force is based on time, distance, and mass measurements seconds, meters, and kilograms. And then you have calculations to do. You first you got to calculate velocities, and then you got to calculate acceleration and stuff. But you can do that, and you can get a force. The stopping time um, has an effect on force size. And so if if you have a bigger stopping time, delta T, if delta T is bigger, that means it takes longer to stop. Delta T bigger means you have a bigger denominator. Bigger denominator means your quotient, your full quotient, is smaller. It's a smaller number. And by the same token, um, if you take less time to stop, if you stop really fast, that means your denominator is smaller and your quotient is going to be bigger. So you're a large uh, stopping force. Okay, And if you're box jumping, you definitely want to have a longer stopping time. Because if you, if you stop really short, that's going to hurt your knees. I mean, if you're supposed to flex your knees a little bit. If you don't flex your knees, if you just land straight legged, oh, you're going to get a hip pointer or something like that. That's no good. All right? It's going to hurt your Bonanza. All right, now here's another way to think about it. 
Uh, longer stopping time, less stopping force. And I'm actually going to give you some homeworks on questions on this on the homework. Okay. So if, if it takes longer to stop, you flex your knees carefully. Um, you're going to, um, it's going to be easier on your knees. Now, here's a second example. It's not in the notes, but let me give you this example. If you are in a car and you're traveling at 10.5 meters per second, and you run into a brick wall, the brick wall will stop you very fast. All right? If you're in an identical car at 10.5 miles or meters per second, and you run into a snow drift, the snow drift is going to stop you in a lot longer of a stopping time. Now, for those of you that are from Florida, snow is this crystalline white stuff that forms when the temperatures get really cold and stuff like that. So if you've never seen it, you know. But where I used to live, they had a lot of snow in the winter. And if you run into a snow drift, it's going to stop you. You know, well, we, when, I, when I was a kid, one time there was this big blizzard and the snow drifts were, you know, like up to here. And so me and my little brother were walking home from downtown. I don't know what we were doing. We were walking home and we were, we could, you could do backflips into the snow drift. And even if you didn't know how to do a backflip, you could still do it and not break your neck because it was a snow drift. Uh, so fast, short stopping time, brick wall. Long stopping time, snow drift. Brick wall, maximum damage to your car because maximum stopping force. Snow drift, minimum damage to your car, if any, because minimum stopping force. Let's keep going. I have another couple clicker questions before we dismiss. We're going to run right up to the buzzer today, so hold on to your hats. Right. Uh, hit the refresh key on your on your calculate on your uh, your what you call it your clicker. All right. Here's your next question. Liter bottle of water, one point zero 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 kilograms. What's the size of your pull force? Your net pull force. Twenty seconds. You don't need to calculate anything, you just need to think. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Boy, you guys are blazing. All right. Yeah, pretty good. Um, correct answer is here. Option A, most of you did choose that. Um, yeah, and so just to make a note of it, this is the official definition of the metric unit of force, which I've made mention of before, but now we can talk about it as a quantity derived from basic units of distance, time, and mass. Uh, the official name is the Newton. Symbol for it is capital N. Uh, and one Newton accelerates one kilogram at a rate of one meter per second squared. So that is the metric unit of force. Um, and you'll, you can read about it in the textbook as well. So uh, we're, we're really blazing here. We're in chapter three, by the way. Um, all right, 342 kilogram T-Rex. Let's do a little practice. Hit the refresh key and then do this numeric question. If you dare, calculating the weight force to the nearest Newton. And do it carefully. Don't round off incorrectly, because some of the students last hour uh, biffed it because they did not round off properly.
30 seconds. The time budget on a midterm is roughly one minute per question. Some questions you'll do fast, some like this one, take a little bit more than a minute. 10 seconds. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right, get your answer in. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, the correct answer is 3352. Most of you got that, but hey, you guys look at this. A few of you rounded off incorrectly. All right, so that's what I was saying. Round off carefully. 3351, 3351.6, no go. Okay, a few more details about mass. Actually, you know what? Let's... Um, Let's uh, let's skip through this um, and let's just go to the last slide here. Um, I want you to bring it, bring your skateboards on Tuesday and. Uh, homework 4 will be activated about supper time tonight. So you're dismissed. I'll see you next week. 120.